Hi, my name is Amy Sullivan, and I'm the current AAAR president-elect, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 19th in our monthly series of AST lectures. This is a new initiative for AAAR being supported by the Freelander Memorial Fund. So with these lectures, we hope to be able to highlight the amazing research happening in our community, to tie our journal to other activities, and also give us all an opportunity to come together outside of the annual conference. So each month, the editors of AST select a high impact journal article to be uh, presented by its authors. These lectures are being recorded and they'll be later posted to AAAR's YouTube channel, which you can access from the AAAR website under the events tab. In addition, each month, one of these lectures are being hosted by one of our student chapters. And so I wanna thank everyone who's helped to make these possible and all of you for joining us. And with that, I'll turn it over to our student chapter from the University of Miami to get us started. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Saluban. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Shruti Chaudhary, the president of the AAAR student chapter and PhD student at the Aerosol and Air Quality Research Laboratory at the University of Miami. On behalf of the University of Miami AAAR student chapter, I warmly welcome you all to the seminar on high throughput generation of aircraft like suit by Una Trevanovic. Una is a PhD candidate at the Particle Technology Laboratory at ETH Zurich, supervised by Professor Sotiris Pratsenis. She obtained her BS in Mechanical Engineering in 2016 from Montana State University with honors. She completed her Master's of Applied Sciences at the University of British Columbia, where she worked with Professor Stephen Rogak. During her Master's, she studied the effects of fuel and entrained salt on soot morphology. She received the National Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada Graduate Scholarship in 2020 to fund doctoral research on soot to aid in reducing its climate and health effects, as well as the number of oral and poster presentation awards at scientific conferences, including the International Aerosol Conference 2022. Her research is funded by Swiss National Science Foundation, uh, we will have about 15 minutes for question and answer at the end of the session. Please feel free to submit your questions through chat during the seminar, and we will go through them in the order. Una, thank you so much for your time today, talking about the interesting work on high throughput generation of suit in laboratory scale studies. Welcome, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. I will share my screen right away. Oh, there we go. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay, so thanks again for that introduction. I'm really excited to get an opportunity to share my research with you all. And thank you also for inviting us to present our research. So for those of you who are not familiar with ETH Zurich, uh, here you can see a picture of our historic main building and some of the rest of the campus in Zurich with the Limat River in the background. Zurich is located right in the center of Europe, and it is the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in German. The university was founded in 1855, and today it has more than 24,000 students from 120 countries and 500 professors. The ETH claims 22 Nobel Prizes from its alumni and faculty. Some notable ones are the very first prize in physics by Wilhelm Röntgen for his work on x-rays, one that needs no introduction, Einstein. Um, and during his time in Switzerland, he actually did his work on Brownian motion that's very relevant for the field of aerosol science. More recently, there's also Rohrer who, obtained, who received his Nobel Prize for his work on the scanning tunneling microscope, which is also very important for the topic today, where it's been used very recently to image the very first incipient soot particles in a flame. So some very important steps in the aerosol community have been done right here at ETH Zurich. Within ETH, we are part of the Particle Technology Laboratory or PTL. And at PTL, we focus on the aerosol synthesis of materials. We do this on a continuum from the fundamentals, understanding how things work, to applications. Some examples are some work that was done previously in the lab looking at how 
two distinct nanoparticles can coalesce together into one larger particle through molecular dynamics, so the smallest scale that we can look at. On a slightly larger scale, work has been done to simulate how particles grow in a flame, going from the inception of particles through to surface growth and aggregation, onto agglomeration, and finally oxidation. Through these models of the morphology of the particles, we can also obtain the optical properties of the soot. These optical properties have been used to improve fire detectors and reduce the number of false alarms, so directly impacting real-world applications. These same optical properties can be used for applications that are very relevant to what I will be talking about today, specifically the direct rated enforcing of black carbon. Large institutions such as the IPCC use climate models that assume that black carbon are spherical particles with an organic coating. And in this top map, what you see are these red hotspots are the regions where a spherical particle would increase the radiative forcing. Now, in reality, these particles are these agglomerated structures still with an organic coating. And actually, when we account for this real agglomerated morphology, this increases the light absorption by 20% compared to spheres. So looking again at these hotspot regions, we see that this, on average, increases the temperature by one degree Celsius. So by not accounting for the realistic morphology, we're really underestimating the impact of these particles on our climate. In the lab, we also do experimental work. And a lot of work has been done on the flame synthesis of inorganic nanomaterials, specifically, for example, in catalysis, also with antibacterial nanosilver. And this, in particular, has spun off into a company, which was actually the first ever ETH spinoff to be listed on the London Stock Exchange, so turned into quite a large company. And this was enabled by the fact that this flame spray process is able to be readily scaled up for industrial applications. In the laboratory, we've shown that we can do this up to five kilograms per hour. So the, by enabling these processes to be scalable, this can go out into real applications. And more recently, a lot of work has been done in the lab on flame-made sensors. Most recently, this has been turned into a spinoff called Olivion, which measures methanol in alcoholic drinks and methanol poisoning can cause blindness or even death and this is now sold in 23 countries to try to prevent such poisoning and of course the topic of today's talk uh, we've used a similar spray process to produce aircraft like soot so that we can study it better in the laboratory before i get into this i want to talk a little bit about my own background as was said in the introduction, I received my bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Montana State University. I then went on to pursue my master of applied science, also in mechanical engineering, at the University of British Columbia, supervised by Professor Stephen Rojak, who some of you may know. And it's during this time that I started my work researching soot aerosols for the first time, specifically looking at their negative health effects and the climate warming impact. During my master's, I did two projects. The first was looking at the size and morphology of soot produced by a dual fuel engine. You can see the ship that this engine was on. Uh, it's a freight ferry that goes between Vancouver and Vancouver Island. And we looked at how the soot from the engine was different when using natural gas or diesel. Second project looked at the morphology and size of soot from gas flares, and gas flares are used in the oil and gas industry to get rid of uneconomical hydrocarbons. And in this process, there's usually water and some salts that are entrained from the natural process. And we wanted to understand how the fuel, water, and addition of salt changed the particles in the end. And that led me to where I am today, pursuing my PhD in mechanical and process engineering at ETH Zurich, supervised by Professor Satiris Pretzinas. So certainly you have all heard about the negative impacts of aircraft emissions. And typically when we talk about this, what we're talking about are the CO2 emissions. However, this is not the only thing that is emitted from an aircraft. There's also water vapor, which is most of what you see in this image and importantly, soot nanoparticles. And in fact, research has shown that 
non-CO2 radiative forcing accounts for nearly two-thirds of aviation's net radiative forcing. So by only focusing on the CO2, we're really missing an important component of the emissions from aircrafts. When it comes to soot specifically, it can increase the radiative forcing through two different mechanisms. First, through direct radiative forcing, where, as we saw a few slides ago, the particles absorb energy from the sun directly, heat up, and thus heat the atmosphere. There's also indirect radiative forcing, where depending on the characteristics of the particles, they interact with water vapor and clouds that are in the atmosphere and change the cloud processes. Another important component is the specific surface area and pore size distributions of these particles, which determines the rate of atmospheric aging. When the particles are freshly emitted, they have certain properties, but as they age in the atmosphere, this changes. And if the properties change, then their direct and indirect radiative forcing also changes. So it's important to quantify these things in order to understand its impact on the climate. And of course, I have to also mention the health effects of such particles. Aircrafts are a source of ultrafine, so less than 100 nanometer particle pollution. Such ultrafine particles are particularly concerning in the area around airports because of a few reasons. The first is how they deposit into our lungs. The graph you see here shows the mobility diameter on the x-axis and on the y-axis, the fraction of particles that are deposited. As you can see, for small particles on the order of 10 nanometers, nearly 90% of particles are deposited into our lungs. At higher sizes on the order of a few hundred nanometers, only about 20% are deposited into lungs, highlighting the importance of small nanoparticles when it comes to the health effects. In addition, recent research has shown that ultrafine particles are particularly good at translocating from our lungs into most organs, including the heart, liver, kidney, and even the brain. Once again, the specific surface area is an important component because it has been shown to be one of the most important metrics for quantifying the toxicity of nanoparticles. And when a particle is smaller, of course, it has a larger surface area compared to larger particles. I'm going to take a minute to define a few terms that we're going to be discussing throughout this presentation. So soot are these agglomerated structures of primarily spherical primary particles. And within a single primary particle, there is a nanostructure, which is basically layers of graphene stacked upon one another. So together, the primary particle diameter and the nanostructure of the primary particles influences the toxicity of the particles, their oxidative potential, and how they interact with light. We also need to define the size of the entire agglomerate. And throughout this presentation, we will be using the mobility diameter. As we saw in the last slide, the mobility diameter determines how these particle de particles deposit in our lungs and also how they transport through the atmosphere. From a chemical perspective, we can quantify the particles with the organic carbon to total carbon ratio or the OCTC ratio. And this is basically a measure of the amount of volatile and semi-volatile compounds to the total amount of carbon in the particle. And the last thing is the specific surface area, which I've mentioned a few times before. These other part uh, parameters that I've specified are routinely measured in the aerosol science community. However, the specific surface area is not routinely measured despite its important implications. And this is because specific surface area measurements require tens of milligrams of soot. This amount of soot is very difficult to obtain. It's nearly impossible to obtain directly from the atmosphere. And even when we're performing engine tests, it would be very costly to run the engines for long enough to obtain this measure of soot and certainly not to do it routinely. So uh, here to put into perspective what aircraft soot looks like, uh, specifically high thrust air aircraft soot, where you can think of the thrust of an aircraft as similar to the gas pedal in your car, when the gas pedal is all the way to the floor, that's 100% thrust. And when your foot is completely off the gas pedal and it's idling, that is 0% thrust. So at high thrust, the OCTC ratios tend to be quite low, less than 25%. And the median mobility diameter ranges from about 10 to 60 nanometers. Now, as a point of reference, diesel engines produce soot with OCTC ratios ranging from 13 to 87%. I'll highlight here that the upper range of this, uh, the upper end of this range is primarily engines at idle. 
and the mobility diameter ranges from about 50 to 300 nanometers, so a little bit bigger than what we see in aircrafts. In order to facilitate soot research, commercial soot generators are often used to produce soot in the laboratory so that we can study things more routinely and cheaply. From this, the Minicast is one of the most well-known generators. However, it cannot produce soot similar to that of aircrafts at high thrust. Specifically, if the OC is small enough, then the mobility diameter tends to be too high or vice versa. So what we did in this work was we used enclosed spray combustion of real jet fuel in order to produce aircraft like soot at high throughputs to 18 milligrams per minute. Here we have a photo of our experimental setup and I'll also show you some schematics. So what we did was we used about four milliliters per minute of jet fuel, jet A1 in this case, that was uh, supplied by a syringe pump. The fuel was surrounded by a high velocity oxygen flow, which disperses it into a fine spray. And surrounding that is a small premixed methane flame, which ignites the spray. Surrounding that is also sheath air. All of this is enclosed in two 30 centimeter long quartz glass tubes, which allows us to control the exact amount of air and fuel in the system and prevents air from being entrained from the outside. So we control the particle properties by varying the effective equivalence ratio or the EQR. So the EQR is the actual fuel to air ratio divided by the stoichiometric fuel to air ratio. So an EQR of one is a stoichiometric flame and an EQR greater than one is a flame with excess fuel in the system. So in this flame, the particles combust in the first tube, and at the end of this first tube, we have a torus ring, which provides nitrogen dilution. This quenches and dilutes the flame, and then particles pass through a second tube where they cool off enough so that we can sample them with a straight tube sampler developed previously in the lab. There is further dilution here through nitrogen and then through a rotating disc, which supplies air. This diluted fraction is sent to our online diagnostics, in this case, the aerosol particle mass analyzer and the scanning mobility particle sizer. There is also a pump, which is sampling particles which bypass the rotating disc and are deposited onto a glass fiber filter for offline analysis. This offline analysis includes thermal gravimetric analysis, transmission electron microscopy, nitrogen absorption, which we use to obtain the specific surface area, Raman spectroscopy, and X-ray diffraction. The first parameter that I want to tell you about is the mobility size distributions. So on the X-axis, we have the mobility diameter, and on the Y-axis, we have the normalized number concentration. Here, the distributions have a line in the middle, which represents the average of 10 different scans with the scanning mobility particle sizer, and the shaded area is the variation between those scans, the standard deviation in particular. So here at the leanest equivalence ratio we used, we have the smallest mobility diameter of approximately 15 nanometers at the median. Increasing the equivalence ratio slightly to 1.29, we increase the median mobility diameter up to about 30 nanometers. As we continue to go to richer and richer flames, as we can see, the distributions shift from left to right up to the highest equivalence ratio of 1.59, which has a mobility diameter of approximately 150 at the median, so an order of magnitude larger than the smallest one. So as we would expect, Richer flames lead to larger particles, and this is because in a richer flame, more particles are nucleated from the beginning. More particles means more collisions and more co coagulation, resulting in these larger, more agglomerated structures. Now we want to compare our results to data from real aircrafts. So here we have data from an aircraft at 3% thrust, 85% thrust, and 100% thrust. So what we can see is that our size distributions span the entire range of sizes that we have observed in the literature on aircraft soot. And in particular, at 85% thrust and 100% thrust, our distributions match those from real aircrafts very well. So as we saw on the last slide, the median mobility diameter increases with the effective equivalence ratio at first quite quickly, and then it levels off at the higher equivalence ratios. We also measured the primary particle diameter with transmission electron microscopy. And what we see here is that 
at the small equivalence ratios from 1.29 up to 1.59, we have a rather constant primary particle diameter of about 14 nanometers. After this point, it begins to increase slightly in the very rich flames up to 23 nanometers. Focusing on the leaner equivalence ratios, which are more aircraft-like, we see that our 14 nanometer primary particle soot is right in the middle of the range typically observed in aircrafts, which ranges from 10 to 20 nanometers for the median. The next thing we looked at was the organic carbon to total carbon ratio. First, using thermal optical analysis, which is the most common technique used in the field. So on the x-axis, we have again the effective equivalence ratio, and on the y-axis, the OCTC ratio as a percent. So here we see that at the leanest flames, we have an OCTC ratio just below 20%, and this drops down to about 10% at an equivalence ratio of 1.59. And we see that this is right in the range of uh, OCTC ratios that we typically expect for aircrafts at high thrust. We also estimated the OCTC ratio from thermal gravimetric analysis, where we measure carefully the mass while we ramp up the temperature under nitrogen and then under an oxidizing environment. And what we see here is that at the smallest equivalence ratios, we have a slightly higher OCTC ratio. And this begins to decrease coming into agreement with the thermal optical analysis at equivalence ratios of 1.46 and 1.59. And at the much richer conditions, this starts to increase slightly again. And we compare to the literature using looking at high thrust aircraft soot from thermal gravimetric analysis, we see that when measuring the OCTC ratio with thermal gravimetric analysis, we systematically see a higher OCTC ratio, suggesting that this is a difference between the two methods. And in both cases, we are in good agreement at the lean equivalence ratios of with aircraft soot, further confirming that we have produced soot similar to that of aircrafts. Next, we measured the mass mobility relationship of the particles by selecting the particles based on their mass and then measuring their mobility size distributions. So on the x-axis, we have the mobility diameter normalized by the median primary particle size. And on the y-axis, we have the number of primary particles per agglomerate. So again, first we have the leanest equivalence ratio of 1.29, 1.34, 1.46, and finally 1.59. And what we see is that all of the data fall in approximately the same line. So we do not see any significant difference in the mass mobility relationships between the different equivalence ratios. But to better understand this, we can look how this compares to the theory. So first I have this solid black line showing a theoretical power law for aggregates, also no known as hard agglomerates. So here the primary particles are strongly fused together through necking and strong chemical bonds. On the other extreme, we can also have agglomerates of monodispersed primary particles, where the primary particles are weakly bonded together just in point contact. What we see here is that the aggregates form an upper bound of our data and the agglomerates form approximately a lower bound. And both of these theories converge at the small number of primary particles per agglomerate, giving approximately the same answer. And only at these larger sizes do they diverge and tell us something meaningful about our particles. What can also happen is we can have agglomerates of aggregates. So smaller aggregates joined together in, with weak bonds into a larger agglomerate. And this falls somewhere in the middle of these two lines. When we look at the line representing the average of all of our data, this falls close to the agglomerates of aggregates line, slightly closer to the power law for aggregates, suggesting that we have highly aggregated structures. And indeed, this is confirmed by the microscopy images, where we see evidence of significant necking between the primary particles, suggesting that they are indeed aggregated. The same data can be used to estimate the effective density of aircrafts. So here on the x-axis, we have the mobility diameter, and on the y-axis, the effective density. So again, starting at the leanest equivalence ratio of 1.29, 1.34, 1.46, and finally 1.59, we see again that there is no significant difference between the different equivalence ratios. But comparing to that from a commercial aircraft, and a helicopter engine, what we see is that our data 
continue the trend that we see from the real aircraft soot and thus are in good agreement with the literature. We can further understand what this tells us by comparing to the theory once again. So here the line represents the agglomeration power law for agglomerates with a primary particle size of 14 nanometers. And the shaded area represents the variation in primary particle sizes that we observed in our data. As we can see, the agglomeration power law describes our data quite well, and we see this characteristic drop in the effective density when we go from small mobility diameters to large mobility diameters. This is expected, of course, because at small mobility diameters, we have small particles with just a few primary particles, and there's not a lot of empty space in the mobility diameter. At high mobility diameters, we have these large fractal agglomerates, which have a lot of empty space, thus lowering the effective density. The last thing we can look at is this universal relationship, where the authors of this study surveyed soot from many different sources, including aircrafts, but also soot from different types of engines and different kinds of flames. What we see is that the line in the middle here is the average of all of these sources and the shaded area is the bounds of the data that were surveyed. Our data and that of the commercial and helicopter engines are on the low end of the effective densities that are measured for from this survey of the data. So what we can see here is that it could be that aircrafts tend to produce soot with lower effective densities compared to soot from other sources. As I mentioned before, one drawback of generators such as the minicast and from real engines is that we get relatively low mass concentrations, which make it difficult to perform certain offline characterizations. So here we see the data of the mass concentration on a log scale here versus the median mobility diameter from a minicast. And as you can see, when we go to the small sizes that are the most relevant for aircraft engines, the mass concentration decreases by nearly two orders of magnitude compared to the particles several when they have several hundred nanometers of mobility diameter. When we compare this to enclosed spray combustion, we see that for all of the median mobility diameters, the enclosed spray combustion soot is three orders of magnitude greater than that of the minicast. And we attribute this first to the use of realistic fuels. So these liquid fuels have more energy density compared to the gaseous fuels that are used in the minicast and thus produce a lot more soot. At the same time, by enclosing the, the flame, we are able to prevent oxidation and keep even these small particles from oxidizing away before we are able to sample them. So this allows us at the high end to produce 18 milligrams per minute of soot. So in this case, we can in just a few minutes obtain enough soot for all of the offline characterization we need. And at the low end, this is 0 0.3 milligrams per minute. So within an hour or maybe two, we still can collect enough soot for our offline measurements. So thanks to these high concentrations, we were able to do nitrogen absorption and obtain the pore size distributions and the specific surface area. So on the x-axis, we have the width of the pores, and on the y-axis, the pore area. So for the leanest equivalence ratio of 1.29, we had a specific surface area of about 160 meters squared per gram. The pore size distributions started off quite small at the large pore widths, and as we go to small pore widths, this begins to increase. At a slightly higher equivalence ratio of 1.34, the specific surface area increases to 239 meters squared per gram, and we see a very similar pore size distribution, but shifted upwards, indicating that there's a slightly higher number of pores, and this higher number of pores is what increases the specific surface area here. If we go to even higher equivalence ratios of 1.46 and also 1.59, we see specific surface areas reaching up to 282 meters squared per gram. So this appears to be due to this increase in the pores in the range of 2 to 4 nanometers, which were not present at the leaner equivalence ratios. So here we see that the Specific surface area is increased by the presence of a small number of pores, because if you remember from before, all of these uh, conditions produce soot with very similar primary particle sizes. And 
Because of that, we would expect that if there were no pores, we would get exactly the same specific surface area. However, I will highlight that in all of these cases, this is a relatively small number of pores and that these specific surface areas are relatively low. So this tells us that in all cases, the particles are relatively non-porous. And without the high concentrations that I showed in the last slide, this data would not have been possible to obtain and we would have missed this nuance. So everything that I've shown you up to now has been somewhat of a black box. We changed the equivalence ratio and we got different particles out. However, we didn't understand what was causing these differences. So we then went on to take this research a step further and we replaced this first quartz glass tube with an identical steel tube that had these sealable sampling ports drilled into the side. And so this allowed us to place that straight tube sampler and also a thermal couple to get the temperature at different heights above the burner and to get then the dynamics of the soot as it travels through the flame. So in this next slide, I have the uh, evolution of the mobility diameter first as a function of the height above the burner and also the residence time in the flame. As we would expect, at the smallest height above the burner, we have the smallest median mobility diameter, and it continues to increase as we go through the, the burner. And at the exit of the flame here, this is about 63 centimeters height above the burner. We also performed simulations to better understand what was going on through this time. So I will take a moment to briefly explain these simulations, but they have been validated extensively in the previous literature that has come out of our laboratory. Basically, how these discrete element models work is we have soot, which we assume is growing through the hydrogen abstraction carbon addition mechanism, or the HACA mechanism. Here, acetylene reacts with the surface of soot and grows the size of the particles through surface growth. At the same time, the model is tracking how the particles flow through the system. And when the particles bump into one another, we assume that they agglomerate together. At the same time, because surface growth is continuing to occur, I, these particles can go from glomerates into aggregates because the surface growth forms necks and hard bonds between the otherwise weak point contact bonds. So as we can see, these simulations were in excellent agreement with the uh, experimental data that we obtained from our system. We also measured the median primary particle diameter, again, from microscopy. And as we see experimentally, already at a height above the burner of five centimeters, we have approximately the same primary particle size as we do at the exit of the burner at 63 centimeters. So we've already obtained the final primary particle size as early as five centimeters above the burner. Now, with the dashed line, we see the simulations of the primary particle diameter. And here, the shaded area represents the stochastic variability between different simulations. And this is actually also present in the mobility diameter line. However, you cannot see it because it's relatively small and hidden by the log scale. So back to the primary particle simulations, we see that they are, again, in excellent agreement with our experimental data. And what the simulations reveal to us is that at this very early stage, below five centimeters height above the burner, particles are mostly single pr primary particles, which are growing through surface growth. Once we reach approximately five centimeters height above the burner, we have these small agglomerates with just a few primary particles. At this point, agglomeration takes over as the dominant mechanism for particle growth, although some surface growth, again, could be occurring and causing aggregation. So as we see in these the visualizations of the particles, as we continue to larger heights above the burner, the particles continue to go grow through agglomeration, while the primary particle size stays approximately the same. Now we can zoom into how the primary particle size distributions evolve through the simulations. So on the x-axis, we have the primary particle diameter, and we have these simulations here, where the line again represents the average of several different simulations, and the shaded area is the variation between those simulations. So at a simulation time of 0 0.8 milliseconds, we have a median primary particle diameter of about 7 nanometers increasing to a simulation time of 
milliseconds. This shifts to the right to a median just above 10 nanometers. And at 12, this increases to a median diameter of 14 nanometers. When we go out to the exit of the flame, which is corresponding to 399 milliseconds, we see that there's virtually no change between the size distribution observed at 12 milliseconds and that observed at about 400 milliseconds. So this really shows that after 12 milliseconds, the primary particle size does not significantly change anymore. And when we compare this to the experimental data that we collected, we see that the experimental data are in excellent agreement with the simulations at 399 and 12 milliseconds. We can, of course, also compare to literature on uh, soot from real aircrafts. In the red triangles, we have at 30% thrust and the inverse black triangles, 100% thrust. And I've chosen these two particular distributions because they represent the range of sizes that we observe in aircrafts, with 30% being the lower end and 100% being the higher end. So most primary particle size distributions from the literature fall somewhere in between these two. And indeed, we see that our data do fall in between these two extremes, and the tails of the distribution line up quite well, so the tail the left-hand tail of our distribution lines up well with the 100% thrust soot, and the right-hand tail of the 30% thrust lines up well again with ours. So further confirming that the size distributions are similar to that from real aircrafts. The next thing that we looked at were the nanostructure of the soot. So we wanted to understand what was happening also on the inside of the particles and not just on the outside. And we did this with Raman spectroscopy. So here we see a characteristic spectra for Raman of soot, and we have these two peaks, first the disorder band and then the graphitic band. In order to try to quantify the amount of order or disorder within the particles, we can take the ratio of the peak intensities and understand something about how the relative amount of order or disorder compares. So here at the leanest equivalence ratio, or sorry, at the smallest height above the burner, five centimeters, uh, we had a D to G ratio of 0 0.85. Moving up to 10 centimeters above the burner, this increased slightly to 0 0.88. At 25 centimeters, this was 0 0.87. And at the exit, it was 0 0.9. So what this shows us is that from 10 centimeters onto the exit of the flame, this was relatively constant, and we had a slight increase in the amount of disorder going from 5 centimeters to 10 centimeters height above the burner. What this confirms is what we saw on the last slide, that in particular, after 5 centimeters height above the burner, we do not have a significant contribution from surface growth because these Raman spectra are fairly unchanged. Once again, we want to compare to the literature on aircrafts. So this dotted line shows the Raman spectra from aircrafts at several different thrusts, and the shaded area represents the variation between these different engine thrusts. And what we see is that once again, our data at the exit of the burner is in excellent uh, agreement with that from real aircrafts. And I'll point out that this is just one exemplary equivalence ratio of 1.46 um, and also holds for the others. So as we showed before, the primary particle diameter at the relatively lean equivalence ratios was nearly identical for here equivalence ratio 1.46 and 1.59. Similarly, the Raman spectra were also nearly indistinguishable. However, if we go to much richer conditions of uh, 1.73 and 1.88, we are able to shift to larger primary particle diameters up to 23 nanometers. And at the same time, the Raman spectra show a decrease in the D to G ratio down to 0 0.8 at the richest equivalence ratio. And this suggests that the particles are more graphitic. So what we see is that high equivalence ratios lead to larger primary particles that are more graphitic. If we plot this Raman D to G ratio as a function of the median primary particle diameter, we see that there is a very clear trend between the degree of graphitization and the size of the particles. 
qualitatively, we can also see this in the microscopy. So as we see for the smaller particles, there is a certain amount of disorder that you can see from the shape within this uh, TEM image. And when we go to the larger particles, visually, you can see that they are much more ordered. And this is probably because of the increased amount of surface growth that was required to make these significantly larger primary particles. And this is not the first time that such a correlation has been observed. This is in agreement with literature which size selected soot from an inverted burner and showed that even within a single flame condition, this sort of correlation held and also on work looking at similar conditions in a gas flare. We wanted to take this one step further and analyze the particles using uh, X-ray diffraction. What X-ray diffraction allows us to see is within a single primary particle, we have these crystallite regions. And the first thing that we can extract from the XRD is the interlayered distance. So this is the distance between the individual layers of graphene. And so as we can see on the left hand, y-axis here, we have the interlayered distance plotted against the median primary particle diameter, and we do see a slight decrease in the distance between the layers as we go from smaller to larger primary particle sizes. The next thing that we can get from XRD is the crystallite length. So we have these different discrete layers that are crystalline, and we get the average length of those layers, of, of these regions, from the XRD. And this shows even more convincingly that we have this correlation between the size of these crystallite regions and the median primary particle diameter. So it increases significantly for these largest primary particles. And I will highlight again that XRD requires slightly larger amounts of soot in a powder form. And so by having these high concentrations, we are really enabled to extract this data potentially for the first time, because this is something that's not often measured in uh, aerosol diagnostics, because uh, it's harder to collect these larger quantities. And the implication of this is that if we have these more disordered particles, that when they're smaller, this could actually decrease their radiative forcing. So small particles from aircrafts could potentially have a smaller radiative forcing compared to other sources. So with that, I will come to my conclusions. The relatively large quantities of aircraft like soot that were generated by our enclosed spray combustion process allowed us to, for example, determine the specific surface area showing that such soot is largely non-porous. In addition, the rather small primary particle sizes lead to less graphitic soot, which may absorb less light and thus lower the direct radiative forcing and subsequent climate impact. So with that, I would like to thank you all for listening and welcome any questions. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Una. Uh, I would again remind everybody to type in your questions in the chat, or you can also unmute yourself and speak up. Uh, meanwhile, when you are typing in your question, I do have a question for Una. Um, so Una, when you mentioned about uh, porosity of the particle, through your lab setup, could you change how porous the particle could be? Uh, yes. So. One way that we can do this is by promoting conditions that cause a little bit more oxidation, particularly if that oxidation is at lower temperatures, which would cause some internal oxidation, thus increasing the porosity rather than shrinking the size of the particles. So one easy way to do that is by um, oxidizing it at low temperatures. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question in the chat from Eugene, uh, the question is, what do you predict will happen with various biofuel blends? Yes, that's a very interesting question and something that we are thinking about. So with the biofuels, it will depend, of course, exactly what is in the chemistry of the biofuel. But typically, a lot of them have um, 
fewer aromatics, which has a lower sooting propensity. And so we would expect to get lower quantities of soot. And in that case, perhaps also um, smaller particles, but primarily the effect I would expect would be a lower number concentration that is being produced. Okay, uh, next question for, for you from Professor Rojak. Um, he says, really impressive and coherent work, Una. Uh, the question for you is, uh, I gather that the local equivalence ratio varies through flame. Do you think this might affect the distribution of properties or are conditions homogeneous? Yes, this would certainly influence the, the results. So um, as you can see, uh, maybe I can show this in the photo. Um, so in the beginning of the flame, it's quite inhomogeneous. Uh, so we have the spray and then there are lots of small regions. Uh, and as we travel through it, it will become more homogeneous. So certainly there will be some regions that are more that have higher equivalence ratios and some that are lower, and this equalizes as we go throughout the flame. Uh, yes, so here uh, you can see this in the very bottom of the photo I have here. It's quite inhomogeneous at first, um, and then as we go through, it begins to homogenize more. Thank you. Uh, I would allow maybe another 30 seconds for questions. Okay, we have more questions. Uh, have you been able to draw conclusions that will help reformulate jet fuel to reduce radiative forcing? Um. Yeah, so, so far, we haven't looked too far into different types of fuel, but that is a direction that we are definitely heading in. And so as we look into what different kinds of fuels, what the effect of different kinds of fuels are, then we hope to be able to answer this in more uh, detail. So this will be our future research direction. Uh, and and um, it will help us to understand the residence time distributions. Okay, just a comment from Dr. Rojak, very well presented. Uh, next question for you. Uh, which probe did you use for sampling? Uh, was the sampling isokinetic and how high was the fuel flow? Uh, yeah, so for the details of the probe, I, I would point you to this uh, citation that I have on the slide here, the number two, where the entire paper is just on the details of the probe, uh, I believe it is isokinetic and the fuel flow is 4.5 milliliters per minute. So the fuel flow is actually quite low um, and we could easily scale up this process by using a higher fuel flow. Okay. Okay, next question for you. Have you thought of using a mini jet engine? Um, it would certainly be interesting to use a mini jet engine. I am not aware of any that we have at ETH at the moment. Um, so we used this to be able to do something more economical in the lab, but it certainly would be interesting to do this with a mini jet engine if we had access to it and to compare our results also to one. Okay. Let's see if we have more questions in the chat. Okay, there's a follow-up question for you. Uh, what about different ambient temperature? Uh, in our lab, we don't really have control over the ambient temperatures. It's just the room temperature. Uh, I expect that this might have some influence, but um, 
If we're not going to extremes, I don't think that it would have a massive influence. We did measure the temperatures, as we said. Um, so I can show you the temperature distributions. Um, one second while I pull that up. There we go. Uh, so here we have the temperature distributions. So as a function of the height above the burner, we have, of course, at the leaner equivalence ratios, higher temperatures. Uh, and as we go out to the exit, the temperatures tend to drop. Uh, depending on the type of engine, these temperatures are on the order of magnitude, uh, maybe slightly on the lower side, but um, in, in the same ballpark. Okay, so I imagine uh, this would also answer the question, the next question, which is, what are the temperatures comparable to commercial engines? Yes. Okay, uh, just waiting on a few more questions if we have. Okay, yes, we do. So does the flame structure influence the size of the soot particles? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by the flame structure, but um, in our case, we in the range of sizes that we have, it doesn't seem to have an effect. Uh, we've looked at some different flow rates and within a sort of reasonable size that fits into our fume hood, we didn't see massive differences in the size of the soot particles based off the structure, mainly just from the uh, equivalence ratio. Uh, Ryan, just to confirm, are you talking about the length to the breadth ratio of the flame or something else? Yeah, so uh, Una, the, by structure, uh, they mean the flame thickness and geometry of the flame front. Uh, I, I don't expect this to have a difference. So uh, we have a spray flame, so we produce very small droplets. So we should have uh, very similar characteristics within our range in the, in the um, flame structure. Okay, uh, there's a next question for you now. Uh, different bypass ratio leads to different exhaust temperature and dilution profile in the engine. Engine with higher and higher bypass ratios are constantly developed. How would you mimic this in the lab? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, maybe I can bring up again the, the schematic that we have here. So a few things that we could do is um, uh, some work that we are actually working on right now. It's under review is we're actually looking at what happens if we add oxygen into this uh, torus ring. And so in that way, we can uh, change the temperature. We, we've looked at how that changes within the tubes and then also reduce the particles by influencing these properties. And of course, when we're developing these new engines, usually they're done with the uh, with the idea of eliminating the soot when possible. So we've also been looking at, in our future work, eliminating the soot emissions as much as possible with the addition of oxygen and different flows. Uh, and by just by adding in oxygen to this ring at a at the end of the flame, we can reduce the soot by 99.6%. So really um, significant reduction to nearly zero by just adding some oxygen. Okay. Uh, so if we do not have any more, oh, we do have a question. So the question is, Thanks for the excellent work and presentation. Did you observe properties of particles further behind the flame? And if yes, how would the distribution, how much the distributions were changing? Uh, 
And did you observe any sampling artifacts due to rapid cooling, thermophoresis, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. So actually in the development of this process, the reason that we added this second tube was actually to prevent this. So what we saw was that this second tube, in addition to the dilution here, allows the particles enough time to cool down so that when we sample them just at the exit, where they also uh, have the highest number concentration, then they're not affected by these kinds of rapid cooling and things like that. So this was at about 63 centimeters height above the burner, but um, not pictured here. We also have a, a large filter at the top, which is collecting the particles. And at some point we placed the sampler there, which was about one meter from the top of the burner. And there we were able to uh, measure the particles again. And between uh, 63 centimeters and one meter, we didn't see any difference in the particle size distributions. So already at the exit, we aren't really seeing effects of the particles when they're being sampled. So they have a sufficient time just in this tube to cool down. Okay, uh, next question for you. The degree of soot oxidation in your system is much reduced compared to a real engine, yet your particles look so similar to real aircraft soot. Why is oxidation not important here? So uh, I'll say two things. The first is that uh, in part, this is why we started this follow-up research that I mentioned, but hasn't been published just yet, where we are adding the oxygen into this torus ring, because this allows us to see what effect the oxidation will have on the particles. So um, at first, our focus was just to understand the surface growth and agglomeration of the particles, and then later on the oxidation. And in addition, I'll point out that um, <laughs> So this work is now being is now under review in environmental science and technology to try to understand how the oxidation affects the particles in addition to just producing them. And and yeah, once again, I'll mention that we can reduce through oxidation the number concentration by ninety nine point six percent. So the oxidation certainly plays a very uh, important role. Okay, Professor Rogic says that. He will read that eagerly. All right, uh, so with the interest of time and respecting everybody else's time, uh, thank you so much, Una, for presenting. I believe it's 7 p.m. or past that for you over there. Um, so thank you all for attending the lecture today. Uh, I hope you all learned a lot. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again for the invitation. It was a great pleasure to get a chance to share my work. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Una. That was really wonderful. Uh, amazing presentation. And Truji, thank you for handling all the, the great questions and uh, discussions. Uh, we, we had a little glitch there at the beginning, but we did a beautiful job in the end. <laughs> bye bye. So thank you all again. Have a jo good rest of your day. It's not evening there yet. So <laughs> you too. Thanks.